Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is our second installment of a global online seminar series in biodiversity informatics. Uh, I'm very happy that this series has gotten going. Um, many of you probably saw our first, which was Jorge Soberon, a month of you a month ago. Um, and just to give you some statistics, 54 people watched the seminar, and 314 people have since uh, watched the video that is on the YouTube channel of the seminar. So I think we're getting quite a good audience, uh, and I know it's from around the world. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'll mention to you our next speaker. Uh, May 29th, we have Jorge Velasquez of the Humboldt Institute in Colombia, and he'll be talking about uh, map annotation and, and user feedback um, on, on modeled maps of, of biodiversity. Um, another housekeeping sort of thing is that you can direct your questions uh, to the Biodiversity Informatics Training Curriculum email. And that email is biodivtraining at gmail.com. So B-I-O-D-I-V-T-R-A-I-N-I-N-G, biodivtraining at gmail.com. And that, I will compile those questions and put them to today's speaker uh, at, the end of, at the end of his seminar. Okay, so today's speaker is Dr. Javier Otegui. Javier is from Spain, where he received his PhD a few years ago. And he's presently a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Colorado. Um, I will editorialize and say basically that Javier and the group that he's, um, he's worked with over the years are generally um, acknowledged to be uh, at least among, if not the, uh, leaders worldwide in visualization of biodiversity data, particularly um, big biodiversity data sets. So with that introduction, Javier, you're on the spot. Um, I will turn the microphone over to Javier Otegui, and I hope you all enjoy the seminar. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this uh, second installment of this series of biodiversity informatics seminars. Um, before I start, I would like to thank Tom for offering me this opportunity. It's a big honor for me to be here presenting a, a bit of the work I did during my PhD student time. Um, I agree with what Dr. Jorge Soberon said in the previous session, that I think this is a series of seminars that will be really useful for people who want to get an approach to different topics of biodiversity informatics. And I'm certainly really happy to be able to be a part of it. Um, so let's get started. I will share my screen with uh, presentation. All right, so if everything works, um, you should see the title slide. The title of this session is Visualizations, Unveiling Patterns in Aggregated Biodiversity Datasets. And it pretty much wraps the three key components of this talk. Uh, the first fundamental thing I want to talk about is aggregated biodiversity datasets. I will not quite focus on techniques to assess the quality of individual records, although it's true that some of the examples I will show are in fact, single record improvements. But the key point here is that I will try to show you how you can use aggregated data sets, the, the collation of different data sources, to get to the second point, unveiling patterns. Um, in this talk, I will use the term pattern in a slightly different meaning than what Dr. Jorge Sabadon used in his talk. Here, a pattern will be just an organized set of values, a, a trend either natural or artificial. And in order to do that, we will use different visualization techniques. So let's begin with 
this last one with the concept of visualization. What is a visualization? What do we mean when we talk about visualization? Uh, well, a visualization is simply the visual output of a piece of information or several pieces of information. It's a representation that's intended to transmit an important message, uh, transmit an idea that has to affect the perspective about something. It doesn't really need to change the idea you have about something. It can also strengthen it, or it can confirm a hypothesis. And this message should ideally contain more information than the raw version of the data. That is the key to visualizations. The important thing here is the message. No matter what, any type of visualization is almost useless unless you can effectively send an idea, any kind of idea, be it the growth of the volume of a database or the habitat suitability model for a given species. That also means that no visualization is right or wrong by itself. It is good or bad depending on how well it sends the idea it's intended to send. I am pretty sure almost, if not all, the listeners have at some point created a visualization. This can be as simple as an Excel chart or as feature-rich as an interactive spatiotemporal map that shows the phylogenetic relationships between taxa. In the most basic forms, even a simple table, a sorted table, for example, can be a valid and powerful visualization. There's a wide spectrum of complexity levels, but in most cases, complexity is not directly related to usefulness. Many, many times, the simplest of the visualizations can be the most effective ones. The use of visualizations has been increasing in the last years, and it's kind of you know, understandable. A picture is worth a thousand words, they say. Studies, studies have found that the human brain deciphers image elements simultaneously as a whole, while language is decoded in a linear sequential manner. This makes the understanding of textual messages slower to process than a single image. And when trying to get an idea beyond the raw message, like the proportions of the different elements of a whole, our brain interprets way better the information if it is visual rather than written. One of the most common types of visualizations that we can see nowadays are infographics, such as this one. We see them wherever we look at. In the last couple of years, the internet has been flooded with infographics. These are actually great ways to condense a lot of information into a single image, a single visual representation, and in a way that makes sense as a whole. We like them precisely because of what I was talking right now. They are really easy to understand, and yet they give a huge amount of information. This effect this population of infographics over the internet is closely related to the concept of big data. Visualizations provide one of the best ways of giving sense to the massive amount of data that's out there. So instead of reading lengthy reports or understanding complex calculations, infographics allow people to understand at a glance what is the key message, what the take-home message is. Uh, visualizations are useful for a wide range of purposes. So far I've showed a couple of examples of the most commonly available ones, like the previous infographic. This is one of the main uses of visual techniques, to make information easily digestible, easy and fast to understand. One of the most simple examples of visualization when we are working with spatial data is a map. So instead of describing where we can find the species, why not let the map speak for itself? This map, for example, it shows the distribution of the mountain lion in South America. And it's definitely faster than explaining, OK, we can see the mountain lion in these parts of Brazil and in these parts of Argentina, but not in these ones, and so on. Um, another example, if we're, for example, managing a collection or several collections, we can create a set of small charts or small plots to work as a dashboard, just like the one I'm showing here from the Atlas of Living Australia. In this case, each of these little pieces, each of these uh, tiles, gives 
an easy to understand piece of information, something that helps understanding what's there within the collection. Visualizations are great tools for showing how things are currently, and sometimes they can even show how things are likely to be in the near future. Of course, this is true only if conditions don't change dramatically. So, for example, this bar plot here, this shows the rate of acquisition of records by decade. And just by looking at it, we get way more information than, than what is represented there. We can have a sense of continuous growth that looks like it's being stopped in the last decade. So we can also, apart from knowing what's there, we can also have an idea of the trend that, the, that it will most likely follow. And this is the second feature of visualization, and for me, the most powerful one. Visualizations can help detecting patterns. They can help unveiling hidden trends in the data they represent. And I say help because they cannot tell you exactly what's going on. The user has to interpret the visualization correctly in order to get the message. For example, among other things, uh, one might want to think about the pattern to figure out if it's a natural pattern or an artifact, if it is something that can happen in nature, or if it's an issue that appeared at any point in the data management process, for example. Let me show you a real-world issue. This is something I discovered during my PhD, and I believe it shows the potential of the right visualization, even if it's a simple visualization. So imagine we have a table with a group of occurrence points for a bunch of bird species. Now let's imagine we want to interpret information on that table. We could just take a look at the raw data, but that won't give much additional information, and it's certainly too hard to understand. So what can we do in order to improve our understanding of this data set? Well, if it's a table with geographic information, why not make a map with the occurrence points? Why not make a density map that each, in which each point shows how many records are there? So we did that, and this is what we found. I really hope you can see this map. So indeed, it shows occurrence points for the bird species, mostly in North America, and some parts of Central and South America as well. But what about this big area down here? Have these birds really been found there? And why does it have so well delimited borders and it's making such a weird picture? Many of you will probably already know what's going on here, but it took us some time to realize that this border here is actually a mirrored image of the east coast of the United States. We look, for example, here's Florida here, and the eastern part of Canada is represented here as well. So what happened here? It turns out that there's a bunch of records that have swapped coordinates. Latitude is stored in the longitude field, and longitude value is stored in the latitude field. This mistake has created a mirrored image of the US which is cut at latitude 90 degrees south. Of course, because there's no point, no point can have a latitude below 90 south. So in this case, we have used the visualization for far more than simple understanding of the content of the table. We have found a strange pattern here, a strange trend in the records, and have led us to discover a flaw in the digitization mechanism. This is just an example of how useful visualizations can be. But also, this is a great example of what can happen when merging two or more data sets from different sources. I would like to put a bit of emphasis on the type of data I will mostly use and analyze in this presentation, and that is primary biodiversity data. We call it primary because it's the most basic piece of information one can gather from the field, free from any type of processing or interpretation. And in general, a primary datum or a primary record contains information about a single occurrence in at least three different basic domains, taxonomic, geospatial, and temporal. These domains allow to answer the corresponding fundamental questions of what has been seen, where, and when. There are many other primary data aspects, like if there's a preserved physical sample of the organism or if it was just field, uh, field observation, 
or who has seen or collected that organism. But the ones I, I show here are the ones that are more used. Then later we can collate and analyze sets of primary data or the mixing of different aspects of primary data to extract what we call secondary data. An example of secondary data is the distribution range for a map, uh, distribution range map for a species, where we put together a lot of geospatial information of individual occurrences of a single species in order to get more refined information about it. So here we will be using two different domains, the geospatial and the taxonomic, and we will be merging several different primary biodiversity records into a single output. However, I will focus on primary data, and especially in large aggregated data sets of primary data. Nowadays, thanks to initiatives such as the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, we can access an incredible amount of biodiversity information. GBIF has been building a network of data publishers in order to allow the access to all this data. These data publishers are institutions that publicly share their biodiversity data collections. And in the GBIF headquarters, they have built a centralized data portal that allows anyone to explore the content of the whole network from a single entry point. As of yesterday, there are more than 441 million primary records available through the GBIF network. But the fundamental concept here is that these records come from very different sources. And although they should ideally aligned to a single common schema, many times there are interoperability issues because of the mixing of different measurement systems. These issues happen when data are stored in different formats without paying attention to how well they will mix with other sources of data. One of the most common examples is the use of different date formats. In the US, the common way of building a date is by putting first the month, then the day, and lastly the year. While in other parts of the world, it, the right order is first day, then month, and lastly year. 